The pathway traveled by genetic information from DNA to protein is well understood and highly conserved throughout life. Grab any organism, whether it be microscopic bacteria from your garden or the largest animal in the sea, and in each of their cells you'll see the exact same process of DNA being transcribed to RNA and RNA being translated to protein. But have you ever wondered how RNA actually becomes protein? Scientists in the mid 20th century sure did. Over 10 grueling years, experts in genetics were able to determine exactly how transcribed mRNA was translated into protein and just how important this process was in the continued survival of all life on Earth. Let's check it out. Aspiring to observe and document translation of RNA to protein is all well and good, but exactly how do you go about doing that? These molecules are incredibly small, and the hunks of junk people of the time called microscopes weren't going to make them any more visible. But scientists had a solution. Observe the process in vitro. They figured that you could do this by taking a tissue sample and breaking it down or homogenizing it into a solution full of fats, water and other solids called a homogenate. But to actually isolate the molecules needed, namely the DNA, RNA, amino acids, ribosomes and transcription enzymes, they need to be separated from the rest of the homogenate. Easy work for a centrifuge. A few rounds would be enough for sufficient separation, allowing the supernatant fluid containing the molecules we need to be extracted. All that's left is to incubate the solution for a while and come back later to check if proteins have been synthesized. At this stage, you're probably wondering this. Just how does doing all of that let us see protein synthesis in vitro? And they had an answer for that. You see, extracting all of the cellular machinery and studying it outside of the cell gives you a huge influence over the resources the machinery has to work with and scientists took advantage of that influence by adding their own special amino acids to the solution before incubating it. These amino acids were charged with a carbon-14 atom. Carbon-14 is a carbon isotope, also known as radiocarbon, and as the name suggests, is radioactive. So the scientists' logic was that if protein synthesis could be triggered outside of the cell, these radioactive amino acids would be used to build the proteins. Therefore, they would come up as radioactive, confirming that the process worked. And spectacularly, this is exactly what happened. Their results showed that as time went on, radioactivity increased, suggesting successful incorporation of the radioactive amino acids into protein in an extracellular environment. With this, research into protein synthesis exploded. Using variations of this method, scientists propelled the field forward with discoveries like the requirement of ATP in protein synthesis, that amino acids must be activated prior to protein synthesis, and that activation is reversible. In combination, these discoveries point towards the existence of a collection of enzymes, each specific to a single amino acid that convert that amino acid into an activated state upon association with ATP. Only then can an amino acid become part of a protein. However, they still couldn't explain why all of this was necessary. But in 1957, a breakthrough was made. Through a modified version of the method we talked about earlier, whereby nucleic acid was examined for radioactivity instead of protein, scientists discovered a new type of RNA, which they called sRNA. They noted that sRNA had a much lower molecular weight than regular RNA, which we now refer to as messenger RNA. And when combined with ATP, amino acid activating enzymes and carbon-14 amino acids will become radioactive. That is, somehow it's been labeled with a carbon-14 amino acid. The most groundbreaking part, however, was the finding that if these amino acid sRNA complexes were added to a solution like the one in the unmodified method, with the addition of GTP, the protein would be radioactive. Seeking to figure out what was going on and hopefully expand on it, they repeated the experiment the following year, only to yield the same results. Firstly, the more ATP present in a solution containing carbon-14 amino acids, the more radioactive the sRNA would become. And secondly, this radioactivity would be transferred to protein again in the presence of GTP. From this data, they concluded that amino acids move from sRNA to protein and that GTP is required for this to occur. This unprecedented discovery suggested that there was a whole step in the RNA translation process that scientists collectively had previously not accounted for. But where does all of this research fit into the modern day context? Since its discovery, sRNA has become known as transfer RNA or tRNA and those activating enzymes are now called aminoacyl tRNA synthetases. 
We know that amino acid tRNA synthetases ensure the correct amino acid is bound to the correct tRNA, and that tRNA is responsible for transferring an amino acid to protein according to a code dictated by messenger RNA, a process that requires GTP to detach the amino acid from the tRNA and join it to the growing peptide chain. The sheer similarity between the process as we know it today and the discoveries made back then goes to show just how important these studies are in our understanding of the fundamentals of genetics. Without them, our knowledge of basic genetic principles would not nearly be as broad, and our understanding of the organisms that inhabit the world around us not nearly as deep.